Phil's is definitely a beloved brand of Silicon Valley. There's a picture of Mark Zuckerberg holding a Phil's cup walking down the hallway. And so many startups have spawned in a Phil's coffee shop. Like, we take such pride in that. Why do some companies succeed in driving growth while others fail? How do some individuals advance in their careers to lead teams that change industries? In the age of mobile, these are the stories of the companies shaping the way we interact with our world and the people who drive their growth. I'm Mada, and I'm the host for How I Grew This. I'm thrilled to have our next guest, Francisca Hawkins, who is currently the VP of Digital and Technology of Phil's Coffee, one of my favorite brands. Previously, she was a manager of e-commerce strategy of Virgin America, where she helped invent the mobile boarding pass. How awesome. So, Francesca, so great having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Let's start with your career. You've had an incredible career so far, from Gap, Virgin America, and now Phil's, all brands that I have <laughs> been slightly obsessed with at different parts of my life. So before we get into that, what makes you you? Are there any experiences outside of your professional life that have directly translated in your success so far? Well, that's a really big question. <laughs> it is, definitely. What makes you you, I mean? What makes me me? Um, my trajectory to where I am today is not a direct path. And I think it's probably one of the most significant things about where I am. I've really focused a lot of my career on operations, but I have a really big art background and an art history background. And the things that have attracted me to those brands of like The Gap and Virgin America and now it fills are brands that I really love. And so what makes me me is I really just do things that I love to do. If I don't like doing it, I feel it just wouldn't be authentic and it wouldn't be me. And so I really love love those brands and I love the companies that have that I've worked for in the past. How do you think that that art background influenced you in your career? You have a background also in your education in art. Mm-hmm. Uh, so and, I, and you, you, you basically mentioned that you have a lot of passion for it. How do you think that has like helped you in your career and influenced it? Well, I actually laugh about that a lot <laughs> because someone who is studying art history doesn't necessarily end up in, you know, working in digital products or, you know, with with um, engineers and leading a team of engineers. But and I actually a lot, I, I'm with my group of girlfriends who are kind of in the same world and we're sort of doing the same thing are also coming from art backgrounds. And I've thought a lot about this quite honestly. And a big part of where I see the real path is, honestly, when you're an artist, you really have to think through what it is that you need to do. You are going to create something, whether you are an abstract expressionist or you're someone like Jackson Pollock, who's just going to throw, you know, paint on a canvas you still have to kind of gather things around you. You have to gather the canvas. You have to gather the paint. You have to gather, you know, all of this stuff. You have to do planning, basically. You do. You have to do planning. And I always say a good artist knows when to put down the paintbrush Mm -hmm. and understand that reaching perfection is something that you will never, ever reach. And for the products that I've created that have been customer-facing, it's a really big philosophy for myself that I have to know when to let go and when it's not that it's good enough. It's got to be great, but I know I'm going to be able to make it better and continue to iterate on that and make it better. And art in my background of art, my father was an artist. My uncle is an artist. I mean, my entire family comes from art and my brother and I are the only ones who are in technology, funny (laughs) enough. But the art itself is about the love of you, the person who's viewing it and the person who is interacting with it and your connection to that piece. But as the creator, it's also understanding that, you know, you, you gotta kind of have to walk away from it at a certain point. And I don't know, that's just, it's... No, it sounds not that different than, you know, products or marketing to some It's extent. actually very logical. I mean, look at Michelangelo. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very logical process and thinking. I mean, you can go all over the place, right? And you can increase your scope. I mean, it's a, it's a really interesting process, but that's just 
the lineage or the, the logical path that I can think of. Interesting. <laughs> so it makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> no, it makes a lot of sense. I, I am I like to paint in my free time and sometimes the reason I don't paint is because I don't plan enough and I'm like, oh I should paint now, but I don't and one the the best pieces I've done was when I had a project or and I planned in advance. So I think it's like a really interesting I never thought about it that way. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's it's a very interesting thing and I think like now I'm gonna plan better for my next <laughs> <piece> of art. <laughs> Uh, but going back to your career, you've had a really interesting career and you said it wasn't linear. And I think one of the things I want to, I want on this podcast is to highlight people's careers and the journeys to, to be who they are. You're a digital leader. I think there's probably many people listening to this who want to get to where you are today. So tell us about your journeys and what, what do you think helped you get to where you are? Again, being a little bit older and actually I I call it, you know, kind of, um, BT before technology <laughs> or B, BI before the internet. <laughs> um, I actually started my career formalizing in New York. I was working for a PR firm putting on events and putting on fashion shows at Bryant Park when it moved from oh, the meat pass. Fun. Yeah, it's a long time ago. Um, and it was great. And what I realized then that I really loved to do is, again, kind of move everything together bring all these pieces together for someone to see. You know, I mean, the whole thing about putting on a fashion show is is about that. You're putting on a production. So, you know, one thing led to another, and I ended up working at a nonprofit and building out their website and then bringing on an event for the entire Orange County where I grew the event from literally, like, I think it was 10,000 people to 24,000 people for a wow. day of volunteering. That's amazing. And then I moved here. Um, I'm from Palo Alto. I'm from, I'm from the Bay Area. Born in San Francisco. Not that many natives that you see today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, born in San Francisco, raised on the peninsula, and I went to Santa Clara. And after I graduated from Santa Clara, that's where kind of the, you know, it took a lot of turns. But my focus at The Gap was really to understand technology and to understand UI and UX and Kelly Goto, she wrote a book on user experience and usability testing. And I really dove into that because I was helping to build what was basically the HR portal for our employees. And that sort of started my career path in developing digital products. But it started with employee experiences. And, yeah, exactly. And so... I helped to build the import employee portal and I focused on language. And I know this sounds a little weird, but change management and user experience, when you start focusing on language like words, if you understand the word compensation, but you're talking to someone, you need someone to go find compensation for someone who doesn't have necessarily the same education background that you do, comp they won't really know where to go and look for their paycheck. So that's very much a kind of the anchor, I would say, um, in understanding how people relate to your product and really, really focusing on testing, really focusing on how you can, in your in focus groups, how you relate to the product itself. Is it intuitive? If it's not intuitive, do you feel stupid? I would never want you to feel stupid, you know, working on one of my yeah. products. So that sort of led my career at Gap. I developed their service anniversary program. I got to work with the CEO of the company and Don Fisher. And then I moved over to Virgin America and did the same thing there, launched a lot of the digital products for nine years. And then when they were per bought out by Alaska Airlines, then I um, went over to Phil's. So at, at Virgin, uh, I think we alluded to this uh, in the intro, you are rumored to have started the mobile boarding pass. Yeah. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what le you know, Tell us about the experience of like, what kind of growth did that lead to? So Virgin America was all about growth, right? I mean, we were on a high growth plan. And so Virgin America, when we first came out, was just, you know, this tiny itty bitty airline. And then we started winning these awards of the number one airline, number, you know, best in class, all of this different stuff. So I actually got the opportunity to work with a lot of the other airlines. And this was at the time, right when the digital wallet came out and Apple introduced the digital wallet. So I joined a consortium and in the consortium was to launch mobile boarding passes. So I introduced the mobile boarding pass to the SFO. And I did it so much not just to engineer the mobile boarding pass, the first one. Um, it was also actually literally working with the hardware. 
and this is the thing I, I mean about my career is that it's not just developing the product. It's actually literally looking at everything holistically, how you're going to engage with it, how the response is going to be, and how you're going to move your way through this journey of this digital product, right? It's not just slapping it and then hopefully it's going to work. There's a big process behind that. So developing the mobile boarding pass in its first iteration didn't really, it, it wasn't widely accepted because Nobody, it wasn't widely promoted. And, but we developed a partnership with like Delta, American Airlines, and United. And so we were doing what was called <laughs> scanner sharing. <laughs> so I would give you, you know, the opportunity to go through my gate. So we all did it together. How was working with, with them? Like, because in some ways you guys are competitors. Oh, it, and then you, building this together, like, I, we don't talk that much to our competitors. <laughs> But maybe it's different in airlines. How does it work? You know, I, I th actually thought the same thing. Working on this airline consortium for mobile, and that was the focus and the objective, was a great partnership because it was about learning from each other and actually offering the customer the best experience. It wasn't about me as an airline being first in class or being the first to introduce because that it wasn't it wasn't about that this was about your customer journey and how i'm going to make it frictionless how i'm going to you know partner because there's a lot of things that are called code share where you actually you know you if you transfer an airline if you're on united and you code share with another airline or have you a partnership like delta and virgin atlantic yeah. you know with a mobile boarding pass it will scan you all the way through so there's a lot of benefit in partnerships like that. Um, but the mobile boarding pass was really a fun project because <laughs> it's like this weird wallet yeah. card, right? And what you can do with it and the marketing opportunities that you could have on that was pretty expansive. But then when we did the, the website for, the, for Virgin America, I don't know if you remember the boarding pass there, but it was a paper boarding pass. <laughs> But it was really funny. It was like kind of you would fold it like origami. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't think I ever. Oh, <laughs> this, this was probably what, during my time when I didn't travel that much. I've had I've had different periods of my life. Yeah. <laughs> well, this was that, that was that interesting. Sounds, <laughs> that sounds interesting. You folded yeah. like origami. Okay. <laughs> it's this really cutting edge technology for you know the first responsive design website, and for people who wanted to print the boarding a paper boarding pass. It literally had, um, there was like a, I think we did a YouTube video for it on how to actually fold it. And so it was... Like I this, mean, that's still so innovative. Totally. And, for you know, when you have this high technology, but you're still relying on paper, why not make that a fun thing? And so that's the work that we did with Work & Co., who was our digital design agency for the Virgin America website. And then we built the mobile app together. What made you decide, you know, you went from clothing to <laughs> travel and now to fills? It's a consumer, I guess, goods company, food and beverages, right? So yeah. what made you decide to join Phil's? I love the Phil's brand and I feel incredibly lucky and just grateful to be able to work again for some great brands. I got introduced to Phil and Jacob when I was at Virgin America because we sold Phil's coffee on board. And you guys are the only one, right? And we were the only ones, yes. And to this day, we've only been, the, Virgin America was the only airline to, to offer that coffee. And we had Phil and Jacob come in to our offices during what was called, you know, like red carpet or, you know, you do training of your staff. And then we, I met them there and I was just so impressed with their passion around having people understand the blend, how they make the coffee and all this other stuff. And Phil is just <laughs> what an amazing person. And um, really both of them are just so incredible. And Jacob, you know, who is obviously the, the son of Phil, um, who's the CEO and he's my boss. You know, I, I came to Phil's because of him. He is an incredible visionary leader, and he is, he's our number one barista, basically. So you can be sitting in an executive meeting, and he's talking about the barista, and he cares so much about you know, his employees and our teammates that whatever we put forth, we have to be considerate. And that is a big part of my career, again, is that you have to look at the operations, you have to look at everything holistically. But he is a really an incredible leader to work for. And when we built the, our mobile app, he was right there with me. I mean, literally, we were attached to the hip developing this product. 
And if you've used the app, you know that the last image that you see is of your barista. Which is, is so personal. So personal, exactly. And that just is all about the brand itself is making sure that it's, yeah. you know, the cup is perfect, making sure that you know who your barista is, that you have that relationship with your barista. Yeah. So I always, you know, say, how do you create that authenticity in a digital product? It's really hard. It's really difficult. And I feel that we were really able to achieve that because of the way the whole product was designed and how it ends with your barista saying, you know, your, your, Francisca, you know, your drink is ready. And so it, it makes it pretty amazing. Any interesting stories you have about, you know, you've, you've helped with digital experiences of so many interesting brands, any interesting growth stories of features or products that drove more growth than you thought, or maybe less growth than you thought. <laughs> I think both of them, I feel like we learn from failures as much as we learn from, oh, yeah. uh, so, so any interesting stories from, from, I mean, you had such an amazing career. Well, the failures that I've, have really attached myself to and swore I would never make that mistake again, really is around testing and, really listening to the customer. First is it's testing the technology. And um, I remember launching a product at Virgin America and we didn't do backwards compatibility testing. And when you're in product and you're working with either new technology or, you know, just you're working with the engineering team, you always have to make sure you do the right, you've got the right QA. And we've come so far now that backwards compatibility is just something that you just do. But that was a huge failure because it, the entire product just bombed because yeah, <laughs> it I just didn't that. work. So it's a, that is a mistake I will never repeat again. But one of probably the best experiences I have ever had, aside from launching the Phil's product, is the experience that I go back to again at Virgin America, and that's and I keep refer- referencing to that com- to this company because it's really where I spent the most amount of my time, and I really that makes a lot of sense. Grew up there, and I really understood you know working with the customers and um, how to launch digital project products. So, but this was this was kind of a unique a, a unique opportunity that I was given, and I had never done anything like this before. But it was to lead a team of thirty six people to do a data migration. Wow. On our reservation system, and I had never done that before. That sounds intense. <laughs> it was really intense, and we literally had to plug. We had to unplug the airline, like turn it off. So we had from eleven o'clock at night when the last plane landed to. Four o'clock in the morning when customers would start checking in online for East Coast flights. Oh, my God. So I had a very short window to do the migration and then do the testing. My number one goal was to make sure I did not hit the news. I did not (laughs) want to be. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't want to be United. I mean, I'm sure you've seen those stories of, you know, United Airlines, you know, where you've got. Just hundreds of passengers in waiting, the lobby uh, waiting. Everywhere. Yeah. And that was that was my number one personal goal is that we will make sure that we get those customers, you know, be wow. checked in. And again, it's all about frictionless. And I think that's a big thing that I'm kind of, I guess, without actually saying it, but is if you can make that customer journey, whether it's your employees or whether it's an actual paying customer, if you can make that customer journey as easy and frictionless as possible, you have succeeded. You make their life so much better, and then you give them the reason to use your your you know your application or your platform or whatever. Um, and I really, really value testing, like to the nth degree. And it's not just automated testing or script testing. It's really testing with you and how you in, how you integrate with the product and what, how it makes you feel is really, really critical to, I think, the success of a lot of the work of, you know, the work that we've done with the, with the companies and stuff like that. And, and what happened? Did you, did you guys make it on oh, time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you it's a cliffhanger. The goal, but then they- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we, we made it on time and we ended up, I ended up leading three other same sort of wow. type of Yippee. migrations. <laughs> 
but I had airports oh. calling in and saying, yep, they can check in. Yep, the reservation system is working just fine, and the website is just fine as well. But there's so many wonderful stories like that that, you know, are so are kind of hidden away in a box. Yeah. Um, People don't talk about these stories as they much, right? Because yeah. they're not that... They're not sexy. They're, they're, they're not, not fun. Sexy. The hardest thing we've ever had to do at Branch was acquiring a company and migrating the customer. So migrations are incredibly hard. Oh, yeah. That is that is really difficult. And how did that go for you? It went well. It was this big company called Tune. Um, they, were, they were the first mobile attribution. Uh, it, but it was, a, it was very hard. It took us like eight months. And it were very intense months for, the, for everyone well, <laughs> involved. But it's also a huge success to be able to acquire a company. Yeah. I mean, that's that's major. It was definitely, definitely, <laughs> it, was definitely it was a team of 70 people, so it wasn't a small acquisition. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I just mean migrations are some of the hardest things. Yeah. <laughs> so when you talked about that, I was like, what? <laughs> yes, and we're about to launch food on our mobile app, and there's migrations involved there. And so, yeah, there's just, again, it's it's testing. You know, at the end of the day, if you really skimp on that, then you're really, you're not doing a good job. I mean, I always reflect on that as, as unsexy as that is. It's it's a really big part of when you're launching a product. It's really important. So I have a, a, a question. That's just my curiosity. <laughs> yes, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so Silicon Valley, I felt like I was watching the show and you... Oh, yeah. <laughs> was it organic <laughs> or planned? Because it was so good. Having Phil's watching. on the show. I mean, you know, it was funny because the branch story is like we, in the first season of Silicon Valley, we're the same size. Like we've kind of followed. And in those early, sh- like we, we lived on Phil's uh, yeah. in those in those early days of branch. And, and all our meetings were at Phil's. <laughs> I interviewed so many people at Phil's because <laughs> was that. our office was too small to do interviews. So like to me, when I watched it on the show, I was like, oh my God, this was so authentic. <laughs> How did they like figure this out? Phil's is definitely a beloved brand of Silicon Valley, for sure. And, you know, there's a picture of Mark Zuckerberg holding a Phil's cup walking down the hallway. And so many startups have spawned, you know, in a Phil's yeah. um, in a Phil's coffee shop. And it's so, like, we take such pride in that. You but, the, <laughs> but the Silicon Valley show, when I joined, um, had already started. Um, but when I joined, I also oversaw the digital marketing team. And we were working with some of the props people, the location people, and I, we were getting ready to do our mobile app. And I'm like, well, here, give them the mobile app. <laughs> I'm like, have them use this as well. That got rejected. Um, but we, you know, we always gave them swag. As much swag as, as they wanted, great. we would give it to them. And I just I loved seeing, you know, the shops built out and I loved seeing, you know, there was, was all really fun. They did an amazing job. They, they really did. did. And they really represented the brand really well. But we literally had no control wow. over that. It was just it was a very organic partnership that we're very grateful for. And they and That's great. yeah, they just did a great job. That's awesome. I'll miss the show. <laughs> I miss the show as well. Let's move. I, I, I kind of, as, as we think about closing, you know, you've led digital for a while. What do you think are the big trends as we think about the future of digital? You know, the um, phone, the phone is our whole lives around, but there, I think AR is going to increase as more and more right. companies are like, you know, the artificial intelligence is helping us personalize everything. Where, what do you think are some big interesting trends that you want to take advantage of in the next few years? Well, I think as everything is moving towards apps on phones and really so much purchasing power is in an app itself these yeah. days, I don't think that you can truly lose sight of your entire ecosystem um, of all your digital channels. You still need to pay attention to that. I've noticed that myself for a lot of customers who you know, try and create an experience on the website, but the website is not actually connected to, the, to our app, which is actually not connected to our store. And there's a reason for that. But as we continue to move forward, it's only going to become more and more important that we actually focus on apps that are allow the customer to have really the least friction, friction-filled experience as possible. So this is really where AI really plays a huge part because there's a lot of recommendations that can come through AI, through data modeling, through data analytics, and all this different stuff. But the biggest feature that I'm most excited about actually is voice ordering. And <laughs> it sounds stupid, <laughs> but and it sounds kind of lazy, actually. But I mean, right. but voice ordering is a huge deal. You're, you're driving, you're like yeah. already on your way to work and you can just voice order. And I, I do think the new generation, I mean, you have children. Yep. I think they use 
voice a lot more than we are. Exactly. <laughs> so I think the the future really is voice. Yeah. And I think that there's also a real importance around data security, data privacy that is critical when you're, you know, as technology is really moving forward with AR, AI and all this other stuff and all this data that's being collected, it's just it's on the company's responsibility to make sure that your data is protected. And that, to me, it becomes more and more important, even as I'm seeing, because you mentioned my children, as I'm seeing them interact, you know, they need to understand that their data needs to be protected, that, you know, they're entering in their information into a lot of different products. And so how companies are using that information is really critical. Um, and I know in California, we just passed the CCPA, which is the California Consumer Protection Act. And I would really, you know, I, I really want corporations to have a feel of responsibility and accountability to ensuring that your data and my data is, is kept private as much as possible, right? I mean, there's financial data that can't be, but there's personal information that can be. So as we launch into and continue to move, technology continues to move forward and into the future, and we do voice ordering, you know, so when you think about yeah. voice ordering and you include voice ordering into your app, it's going to integrate with your digital wallet which is gonna integrate with your credit card information. So you're actually creating a purchase through voice ordering. And even though Echo you know, does that yeah. today, the way that we can start to apply that on a very small scale, so like ordering your cup of coffee, you know, you're like, hey Siri, <laughs> you know. I want my min mojito. I want my min mojito. <laughs> I'm 10 minutes away from Phil's. Exactly. You're like, I want my mint mojito. Large. Large, always. I'm obsessed with Yeah, that. from the Red, Redwood City location. Oh, here's, she just turned on. And, um, and, you know, so it's super exciting to me to see this new technology emerge and how you can make this better as an experience for you from, you know, recommending products of people like you. But I still want to make sure that you're treated personally and that I make you feel like you are the most important one who comes, a customer that comes to my app. You know, I want to make sure that you don't feel like you're just a transaction. So to me, that's how we have to shape this emerging technology is to not lose that personalization and to not lose and normalize too much of, I think, human behavior. I don't, I don't know. It's yeah. I don't know if that if that makes sense or no, not. No, it but does. That's really interesting. Uh, and I, I I totally understand that. I think the mobile ecosystem is getting more and more fragmented. So I think it's becoming easier and easier to use the connection. The more devices people use and they interact with your brand or across many devices and keep a track of the customer and giving them that like you're still a human across their watch yeah. and I think I think that makes a lot of sense well I, I'm looking at TikTok right now yeah. because my daughter looks at TikTok all the time yes and it's so, pretty awesome actually <laughs> and it's it really an interesting platform because it's all user generated content right and they're just create they TikTok just created this space for you to go and do this yeah. random dance. But the growth and the adoption rate of TikTok is, I mean, it's huge. It's exponential. And their profit rate is also insane. So the question then becomes sustainability. Like how long can TikTok sustain that? And how, what's the new thing that they're going to be bringing on? And I, I'm, not, I'm not a TikTok user. Yeah. Um, but it's thankfully, not like, <laughs> I don't it's think not anybody wants to YouTube, see me on right? Like in the early days when YouTube well, exactly. started, yeah. it was so fast. And, and, you know, YouTube is still around and they found yep. a way. So it's very interesting to see what TikTok does as well. Yeah. And the same thing with Snapchat as well. You know, I think, you know, just watching user generated platforms and the developing content, what is going to be that next thing that's going to excite the newer generation? And I look at, you know, I. I look at Julia, I'm like, well, think about it. Like, think, think what, what are you missing from TikTok? And what would you like to have on TikTok? And think about that because think about what, because if you're thinking about it, then you know someone else is thinking about it. So then start thinking about creating the next thing. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that. I love that. So you're already pushing your children to be entrepreneurs. Okay, good. Artists first. <laughs> Artists first. Artists first. <laughs> be creative. Um, well, awesome. I think... No, I, I want to end on asking, you know, what piece of advice you have for our listeners? You've had an amazing career. And I, I feel like if you think about careers in general, there's always this 
forking paths. Yeah. And I think to to get an advance in your career, and even if I think about mine, there's always been a fork and I took one turn versus another. If you think about advice for our listeners, what is one piece of advice as, as they look at the forking paths in their careers and as they they look to make a next step? What, what do you think helped you and what do you think would help them? I think the thing that helped me when I was in college specifically, someone came in and said, you know, you're not going to be doing what you're studying. Like, you know, your job is not going to be this. And I was like, oh, I'm going to be a curator. You know, I'm going to be a conservationist. I'm going to be this. You know, I was going to be so in the art world. And the more I worked in the art world, the more I realized it actually wasn't for me. And that was a fork in the road because I refused to listen to that advice, but it was always in the back of my mind, which when I really started thinking about what is it that I love to do, that really helped to drive my work. And I can't say that my, I ever made a statement that I'm going to be you know, developing digital products that consumers love. That wasn't my objective. My objective really, and everything started forming when I worked at a nonprofit, and that was I developed their website with emerging technology at that time. Websites were barely on the like cusp of being created. I worked with the customer, and I loved that interaction so much that everything that I did after that made sure that I incorporated technology because I loved technology and what it enabled people to do. But I didn't stick to one idea. I actually really wanted to be, if you want to know the truth, I wanted to be the chief operational officer at Gap. <laughs> Okay. I, I mean, I don't know why I'm laughing because I feel you would no, have probably done an amazing job for that. I wanted to be Anne Gust. That's who I wanted to be. I looked at her like she was God. And because imagine her responsibility, imagine the scope of her work. But that was obviously, that didn't come to my reality. But what it incorporated as I continued to move along in my career is how much I valued operations. So even though I worked for a nonprofit, I worked for you know a clothing retailer, I worked for an airline, and now I work for a food retailer or a coffee retailer, they all there's a common thread through all of that, and that is is that they all are operational. Yeah, it's, they are. It's hub and spoke. Yeah. It is customer. And it is employee. And you can never forget about those two experiences because if it doesn't work for you as, as, a, as an employee, I guarantee you it's not going to work for the customer. Think about how many bad customer experiences you've had. So long answer to your question, which is have faith in your experiences because every experience is going to build upon something else. And I'm sure people have heard that before, but the reality is, is that I refuse to work for a brand I don't believe in. Ethically, environmentally, it has to it has to resonate with me as a person and then I feel really good about building for that company and helping to that support that company. But everything I've done has led to where I am right now and that is really about creating products that consumers love. I can now put that into a soundbite. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> I love that. Well, Thank you so much. Oh, it thank was you. such an interesting conversation. I feel I learned a lot and I hope our audience does as well. And uh, we really appreciate your time. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, please leave a review wherever you listen to this and share with someone trying to grow their career. Until next time, keep growing. Keep growing.